Only 15% that watch my videos are subscribed. Please don't forget to if you like my content. This helps me out a lot. Enjoy the video. I'm a public defender, and my newest client murdered vampires. They say that if you practice law long enough, eventually you'll find the case that'll break you. Well, I've only been in practice for a few years, but I already found mine. The type of case that places not only your mind and body in peril, but your soul itself, if you believe in such a thing. It all started about a week ago when I was assigned the representation of one Turner Dunn, an elementary school custodian accused of slaughtering three people here in rural Pennsylvania. I'm going to stick with people for purposes of this account, though my subsequent investigation calls that designation into question. What I'll say for now is that the victims are no longer in their graves and leave it at that. They were corrupted, is how Turner himself plainly described it. I had to eliminate them. They were taking over the whole damn town. That's what he'd said the first time I visited him, at the tiny county jail, where murderers get mixed in with drunken brawlers, spoozle abusers, and small-time drug dealers before they are processed through the state and sent their separate ways. I was assigned the case in my role as local public defender. Said another way, Turner couldn't afford a private lawyer, so he was assigned to me. Knowing what I know now, I do believe he assaulted three individuals, though I do not believe he had the necessary mens rea to commit the crime. Plus, murder requires, you know, actually killing someone. Turner told me that he'd served as night janitor at G. Torres Sunt Elementary since graduating from a local high school in the mid-90s. He described himself as a loner, someone who preferred working in the shadows. He described the night of the massacre as follows. He was working the night shift when he decided to hoof it to a local 24-hour convenience store to buy a pack of smokes and a cup of coffee. This was a normal routine for Turner, or at least had been since he'd lost his car in his divorce. Not to my wife, he had explained. To my divorce lawyer. Only way I could afford her. Turner said he had planned to walk to a store outside town limits on this particular night. I already knew then that plenty of people weren't acting right, he explained. Something foul was in the air. Even the children were acting different when I worked the day shift. It's like they weren't even kids anymore. He said he locked up the school at around 3 a.m. and cut through the town's church graveyard on the way out of town. Something that he said he didn't find creepy because he'd done it so often and because he was used to being alone at night given his line of work. Like a vampire, he said he preferred the night. When he reached the entrance of the graveyard, he heard a loud, shrieking sound. At first, he thought it was a coyote or some other type of nocturnal creature, but he could soon make out a woman's voice screaming, I've changed my mind, I've changed my mind, oh God, let me go. Turner said he next heard another voice, a deep male one that seemed almost inhuman. You offered to spill the blood, the voice said, to walk forever with your daughter. There's no going back now. At least, that's what my case notes say. Not that I believed Turner's story when he first told me all this. Turner claimed he then rushed toward the voices where he found three locals crouching over a 30-ish woman, a local teacher. The aggressors were the town's mail carrier, the middle school's bus driver, and a Catholic priest. I know, it sounds like the build-up to a joke, right? <laughs> Turner said it seemed the priest was in charge as he held a long, sharp Kaiser blade in his hand. One of them had already slit her throat and were allowing the blood to drip into a chalice-like cup held up by the bus driver, a local named Pam Harper. To Eden, the mail carrier said. The return to Eden, the priest countered. They apparently took turns drinking from the chalice, and the priest chided the bus driver. Make sure you save some for the master. You know we must tithe. Holding the whimpering woman down, they began to bite at her bare skin, drawing blood and sucking it up as though they were leeches. It was disturbing as hell, Turner said, fidgeting in his seat something fierce. My God, it was evil, evil in its purest form. And I don't need my notes to recall that much. I can still remember Turner's disgusted face as he said it, the way his fingers gently traced the jail library books 
that were set out before him on the rickety wooden table. So I did what any rational person would do, Turner said. I pulled out the little handgun I kept with me, should anyone sneak into the school at night, and I blasted them suckers. Literally suckers, I said, but Turner wasn't amused. Don't tell me you've never dealt with the occult before, he said, grimly serious. Practicing out here in the sticks? Oh, the odd ritualistic murder or two, I said. But literal vampires? No, that would be a first. These weren't vampires, Turner said, at least I don't think. Not yet, anyway. More like vampires' helpers. I asked Turner how, if this was all true, the woman who had been sliced open had communicated an entirely different story. You are aware that Stephanie Daniels told the police she was performing a prayer for her deceased daughter when you came out of nowhere, guns ablazing. Yes, Turner had said. Of course I know what she said and I know how it looks, but something must have changed in her by the time I flagged down the county sheriff. Whoever or whatever else was waiting out there must have speeded up her transformation. He claimed it wouldn't be the first time that his tiny town had been slowly converted into a town of monsters. Vampires, or something vampire-like to be precise. He described chronic absenteeism at school and work, abrupt personality changes, strange disappearances and reappearances, missing bodies, desecrated graves. I asked him why he didn't inform law enforcement before the night of the so-called massacre, and he insisted that the locale police were among the first to be converted, and at any rate, he didn't think any other law enforcement would believe the conspiracies of some middle-aged janitor. Said that half the time he had a hard time believing it himself. Unless you're trying to plead insanity, I had told him, your story isn't going to go over very well with a jury of your peers. It was, unbelievably, the craziest story I had ever heard in a long career of crazy stories. Totally and utterly unhinged. Go there, he insisted. Go to the town yourself and see if you really think I'm a nut. Then his eyes grew wide with fear. But if you do, counselor, then by God, bring along a posse, some fresh garlic and some mighty sharp wooden stakes. Your laws will mean nothing out there. The next day I went to Jiwail with a loan, sans posse, garlic, or stakes. Us public defenders don't exactly have the budget for posses. Besides, I had been practicing long enough to give little credit to paranoid delusions. Sometimes people just break. It isn't really their fault, but it's not necessarily my job to believe them, just to help them as best I can with the limited tools at my disposal. That's how I saw it anyway back then. The first odd thing I noticed, as drove up a gravel street toward the center of town, was how quiet it was. Describing something as eerily quiet seems like a cliché, and I suppose it is, but that's the best way I can describe what I witnessed. A dead zone, a broken promise of a place. The first thing I did was stop at the local police station. It was an old building, apparently one that used to be the public library, based on the fading letters that adorned its white brick exterior. There was no receptionist, so I shouted, Hello, as I stood in the worn out, 70s shag carpeted lobby. An officer appeared a minute later, wearing dark sunglasses indoors. His skin was an icky greenish shade. I assumed he was jaundiced from liver failure. The cops in the sticks know how to party with the best of them. You're not from around here, the officer said, though it was more of a statement than a question. Are you, son? His voice was slimy sounding, oozy. I explained the situation, and I soon had his full attention, though perhaps for the wrong reasons. Are you alone? He had asked, his eyes constantly darting around the room. I'm with some others, I lied. I can show you around the town, help you make the right connections, the officer said. But it will have to be tonight. He forced a brackish smile. Paperwork, he explained. I noticed that the notepad poking out of his uniform was stained the blackish red of dried blood. I'll come back later, I lied. Around sundown? The officer asked me to wait a moment before I left, but by then I was already backpedaling out of the station, unnerved, bordering on utterly creeped out. As I exited, I swore I heard whispering from the hallway behind him. He knows, was what the whispering sounded like. He knows. 
By then I felt more than a bit jittery, if not outright fearful, but I decided to carry on with my investigation. It's not that I'm particularly brave, just that I've seen a lot of strange things in my job. I don't have the energy to get into it now, but needless to say, public defenders deal with all kinds. I say this because I'm sure you now doubt the veracity of this tale, as I originally doubted Turner Dunn's. But maybe this world is a bit weirder than we're given to believe. Despite my unease, I decided to visit Stephanie Daniels, the woman who apparently came back from the dead, or at the very least recovered from a slit throat in record timing. She lived, or perhaps now it was unlived, in an old Victorian off Main Street. I parked outside the house, noticing how all its windows appeared to be sealed off, boarded up. Heavy black curtains, like the kind that, yes, a vampire might use to keep out the sun. I noticed a similar effect in some of the other local houses, as though, gee, were an Alaskan town besieged by 24-hour daylight rather than just another rural community in good old Pensiltuki. I sat in front of the house for a while, stalling. I felt some strange malevolence in the town generally, but something felt more specifically off about this house. I tried to check my emails, hoping to buy some time, but I had no reception. A not uncommon issue where we live and having nothing to do with the supernatural or occult. Or so I assume. I had the distinct feeling of being watched, though the streets were quiet. No children jumping rope, no old men tending to their lawns with desperate precision, not even any cars around, save the ones scattered about, parked like lumpy glacier rocks. I got out of my old Ford F-150 and made my way outside. The sun was still bright and high in the sky, and I felt embarrassed that I took comfort in that fact. I climbed up a few porch steps which were as soft as butter and inched my way to the front door. I knocked three times and then rang the doorbell for good measure. Then I waited and waited, but nobody answered. In the driveway was a freshly polished green Subaru. I walked around the back of the house to find a clothesline stuffed with bedsheets and clothes stained a blackish red. I tried the front door again with no answer, and with a morbid sensation of fear gripping me, made my back to my truck. A few moments later I was turning onto Main Street when another truck crashed into the passenger side of my vehicle at full impact. No airbag went off because my truck was too old for such safety measures. A true classic. And if you've ever heard the saying, they don't make them like they used to, then that might very well be true. The newer truck that had crashed into me crinkled in on itself like a sardine can, whereas my Ford screeched a loud clang and was simply brought to rest in a slow motion puff of unleashed hood steam. Shit, I said, wiping some blood from my brow. My head had struck the steering wheel, but I felt generally okay, aside from a bloody nose. It didn't feel broken, just slightly mangled. A dripper, rather than a gusher. As I made my way to check on the other driver, I noticed it was a priest, or at the very least, someone wearing the priest garb. I'm so sorry, the priest said, in what was indeed an inhuman sounding voice. I simply wasn't paying attention. I didn't even see you there. Are you okay? I asked. I noticed that his head looked positively bashed in, and yet he was not bleeding. His skin looked dry and drained. His right eye was all but detached, and yet he acted as though he had suffered a paper cut. I am perfectly fine, my son, the priest said, but we better call the police. More like an ambulance, I said. Stay still and don't move. I didn't want him to make anything worse. The priest kept playing with something in his seat. When I leaned over, I saw what it was. He was attempting to reattach his right arm, which had been severed in the accident. Only there was no blood at all. You're not bleeding, I said, as much to myself as him. Why, of course I am, the priest said, bleeding all over. Why, you must have suffered a concussion. Now hold on while I call the police. I think you need medical assistance. But by then I already saw a police cruiser rushing toward us. I looked to the bloodless priest, then to the jaundiced face of the officer I had just spoken with, and then I gathered my briefcase tight to my body and bolted away. He knows, hissed the priest in that inhuman voice. Get after him, Bill. By Christ he knows. And now, though I wish to continue my story, my head is throbbing 
and I can't possibly get any more words typed out. I am so sorry to leave you in media res, but I need to take a nap before I can go on. I will check back soon to continue with what happened next, I promise, and assuming I'm still all here. I'm just so weak from all that transpired, and my body must rest for now. So there I was, stuck in G, in with no ride, no friends, and the sinking suspicion that my client Turner Dunn was right. This town really was being taken over by bloodthirsty vampires. How else to explain the priest's severed arm producing no blood, the uneasiness of the jaundiced police officer who insisted we meet again at night, the bloody clothes that hung like a battered piñatas from Stephanie Daniels' clothesline. It seemed that Jiwonyo had all at once become a dry town, and I don't mean they were no longer serving alcohol. But as I tripped and slid through the high reeds of an open sewer creek, taking in the reek of raw sewage through my busted nose, I couldn't help but consider things how a judge or jury might. After all, I had now fled the scene of an accident. Worse yet, had sprinted way from the police cruiser as though I had done something wrong. I've seen people get booked for much less, especially in our not-so-just justice system. I had to table such thoughts piker that I was, because at that moment I heard a whispering, shh, from inside a nearby tunnel. One of those open-faced sewer tunnels, where you can imagine uncanny alligators might reside, until you remember you're in northeast Appalachia. Go on, I said to the faceless voice from inside that dark void. If you're going to kill me, just do it already. I'm not going to kill you, came a tiny voice. But if you don't hide in here, the others might. I trundled to the crevice and peered in. A child stood before me, his face partially subsumed by dwindling light. No more than ten or eleven from the look of it. A worn Yankee's cap slicked across his greasy hair, and his eyes seemed to glow with feline intensity. Are you a vampire? I asked. Because you're sure lurking in the shadows like one. Hard to hide in the light, mister, the voice murmured. And who said anything about vampires? This made me feel a bit better. Perhaps I had misjudged the town after all, had slid right off old Occam's razor and straight into La La Land bleeding all the way. I didn't exactly have gray in my beard yet, but I thought I'd been practicing long enough to no longer get wrapped up in my client's delusions, yet here I was. Of course there's no vampires, I said, pinching at my nose, almost believing it. I know, the child said, they're zombie witches. The thing about this new generation is they're apparently misinformed when it comes to monster tropes. My parents' generation had learned that vampires were to be feared, and my generation had learned they were to be fucked, but apparently these pandemic babies didn't know their ass from their elbow when it came to basic vampire lore. They like, eat people, the child said. By then I had learned his name was Reggie, which means they're zombies, but they also chant strange witchy things, so I think that make them zombie witches. But vampires eat people too, I said, or more specifically suck their blood. Whatever. Reggie said, leaning against the sewer walls, becoming one with that true bacterial fantasia. All I know is they bit my parents, and then my parents wanted to bite me. He looked up at me as though I were the dumbest human on the planet, and maybe he wasn't far off. Zombies, he said, definitively. From what I gathered, Reggie and his family resided in a local trailer park. His mother worked at the diner waiting tables and his father was an angry, bitter man even before he made his little pact with the Dark Lord. Reggie had a half-sister, who had recently been taken away by Child Protective Services, and one can assume it was all for the better. A world where vampires were real and Child Protective Services were competent, I really had gone through the looking glass, being tiny and resilient, if not intelligent about suddenly life-defining monster tropes Reggie had apparently spent the past few days farting around in the sewer system, something he apparently also did before his town. Er, gruesome teeth. I offered him an old banana from my briefcase and my deepest condolences. How do you know I'm not a zombie witch? I asked. Simple, he replied. You haven't tried to eat me yet, and that's how you know I ain't one either. I asked Reggie if he knew Turner Dunn and he said he did but everyone in school called him Turdler Dunn, 
because he was always cleaning toilets. He said the kids hated him because he was always in a foul mood, pushing his mop around, tripping children with gleeful hate in his eyes and so on. I asked Reggie if there were any other humans left, and he said maybe there was and maybe there wasn't, but he wasn't much inclined to find out. He asked me if I had a plan, and I said we should hide in the sewer system and wait things out. This didn't impress Reggie much, that my plans were apparently no better than his own despite our decided age difference. Reggie said we would have to hoof it to a nearby stream if we were going to have anything to drink and it was better to do it by light of day. Having no better options, I started to follow the fleet-footed little shit, struggling to keep up. I never much liked children, not even when I was a child myself, but I was out of ideas and, like the vampires, increasingly thirsty. As we walked, I noticed that the child left no reflection in the water. I seemed to recall something about reflections and vampires, but then settled on that being in photographs. By then, I was feeling a bit groggy from the head trauma, and the boy was too fast to get a good look, so I kept following. We eventually came upon a stream, though it wasn't apparent that its source was any different from the sewer. I didn't want to explain the contours of my germophobia to the child, who was already on his hands and knees scooping the water to his mouth, so I just hung back. Come on, he said. It tastes good. I told him that so did chocolate to dogs, but that didn't mean it wasn't poisonous, but he kept gulping away. The banana I had given him was still in his pocket. I would have assumed he'd have scarfed it down straight away. I felt a twinge of fear shivering up my spine, and then I felt like a giant dork for fearing a 90-pound child. If I had a significant other, I thought, they would really be embarrassed at how callow I was feeling. I walked toward the boy to see if I could make out a reflection when he wheeled around on me and started slurping up the blood from my nose. I pushed him off of me and stared in disbelief as Reggie, or what used to be Reggie, licked my blood from his fingers. I hadn't noticed before how green he looked in the light. I can't bite, Reggie said. My big teeth haven't grown in yet. I can only drink the blood of lamb. So I suppose that makes you a zombie witch? I asked. No, Reggie said. You were right all along. I'm a vampire. He started screaming. He's here. He's here. My heart racing with fear, I flung little Reggie into the stream and cut my way up and away from the water, darting through old growth forest and wishing I'd kept up with my law school cardio routine. He's getting away, stupid fucking Reggie screamed behind me. By then I was inexplicably back in Stephanie Daniel's backyard, unless there happened to be another Victorian with blood-stained clotheslines, and in this town, I couldn't exactly rule that out. I climbed in through a basement window and slinked my way into a crawl space. There I tried my phone again but it still had no reception and was also running distressingly low on battery. I used the flashlight app and saw that the basement looked like a kid's playroom had just exploded. Stuffies and dollhouses and even a tiny porcelain white crib. There was also a coffin-shaped pine box that I dared not open, one too large for a child of normal proportions. Everything else seemed right out of a nursery. That's right, I suddenly remembered. Stephanie Daniels had wanted to join the vampy cult so she could be with her dead daughter. Turner had said the vampy crew had been meeting at her daughter's gravesite. The police report indicated the child had died a couple years earlier from severe pneumonia. I tell you, there's evil in this world down to the microscopic level. These thoughts were interrupted by a creaking sound upstairs, that of a chair rocking. I tiptoed my way to the top of the stairs and found the basement door cracked ajar, just an inch. Outside in the living room, I could make out Stephanie Daniels. I recognized her from the case file photos, rocking a pale toddler. In her hand was a clear baby bottle with which she was feeding to the child. The baby bottle was filled not with milk or formula, but with a black-red blood. The child sucked on the nub of the bottle greedily, hissing and writhing in delight. She was all but a skeleton. I'm not sure what type of curse gave her human form at all. By any normal biology, the child should have been nothing more than a skeleton sporting a creepy tuft of hair. Stephanie was humming some mesmeric-sounding nursery song. I didn't recognize the tune. Perhaps the vampies have their own music catalog. La fa la do la, Stephanie cooed, a cursed chant to my ears. 
Across her neck was a long, blistering, fresh scar. Turner was right. She had been stabbed. How had the county sheriff missed that? The report indicated Stephanie had no signs of lesions or trauma of any kind. It must have been my weariness. I'm not sure what else could have done it, as I'm really not one for a death wish. But at that moment, I swayed ever so gently and bumped my still bleeding nose against the basement door. Immediately, Stephanie's eyes darted to the door jam and my stupid face. I didn't know we had a visitor, she said to the child. She spoke with the soothing yet creepy voice of a dental hygienist about to dig into an inflamed gum. May I please ask what you're doing in our house, she said. I pushed open the basement door more out of curiosity than any latent bravery. For Christ's sakes, I said, pointing to the bottle, you've made an abomination of your daughter. For Satan's sakes, she said, you've made an abomination of yourself. Stephanie Daniels, or what had become of her, strapped on one of those icky baby carriers that go around one's shoulder to keep the hands free. She took her time in doing so. Meanwhile, Skeela Baby slurped at the bottle which she now held tightly in her own desecrated little claws. I don't believe we've met, Stephanie said. And even if we did, I doubt you'd recognize me now. It's been a busy few days, hasn't it, little Aurora? She said to her daughter. She stared up at me and winked a soulless facial twitch from her gaunt face. I'm a lawyer, I said as though I owed her an explanation, and I felt in a way that I did, having broken into her house. She giggled. A lawyer, she repeated. Then come join us. Clearly you're meant to play for our side. She moved toward me and I flashed my cell phone at her, flashlight app blazing. Ah, she said, turning away at my steel attack but laughing too, as though at the ridiculous of it all. That's when my fucking cell phone died. She lunged at me, and this time I tripped over my own shoes and fell down the flight of hard, gray basement steps. She laughed at the top of the stairs as though this was mere theater. A Saturday night live cast member throwing themselves over a cardboard sofa. Despite the fall, I wasn't in very much pain. I had sort of caught myself against the railing a few times on the tumble, and one strength I've always had is I'm quite hard-headed. I laid in a messy heap at the bottom of the stairs. Then I gathered myself together and slipped out the window I had entered back into the purifying light of a now descending sun. Rosy red, glimmering. There's hope in the sun even if it's capable of burning our eyes out. As I ran away, I could Stephanie and little Aurora screaming into the basement and tearing their way through the deed nursery. I didn't wait for them to see I'd escaped. But I write these words while lightly sedated at a local hospital. I'm gathering my strength to tell my story in full, considering one last attempt to prove that neither Turner Dunn nor I suffer from any form of hysteria. You'd been in a car accident, the sheriff said. You fell down a flight of stairs. Of course, your ability to discern reality is somewhat impeded. I so want to continue with what happened. But as before, the telling makes me weary, as the various meds act and counteract in my system, and the nurses come and go, checking my vital signs and working to ensure I don't try another jailbreak. Before I could go on and on typing, a laptop is any good lawyer's weapon of choice, but I fear this is where my fingers must stop their typing, for now. Toward the end of my first meeting with Turner Dunn, he told me that being attacked by vampires wasn't the worst thing that happened to him during his ordeal. It was not being believed by regular old humans that really got to him. The way you're looking at me right now, he had said, as though I'm crazy when I know that I'm not. And now I can relate as I sit here in the hospital being watched over with dutiful indifference, as though I'm some lonely senior in a nursing home. But I digress and I don't have time to digress. I have to get out of here. I need to get back to Judd T. Uh, with garlic and steaks, like I should have done the first time. I just need to allow the sedation to wear off and in the meantime, write this out so everyone knows what is going on. As I was saying before I drifted off, I had escaped from Stephanie Daniels' house and was leaving her and her vampy Skeela baby behind when I saw the police cruiser turn the corner. Gunshots blasted against the cruiser from one of the boarded up houses, but everyone knows guns have no effect on vampires. All it did was help to slow down the cruiser some 
and give me hope that the town had not yet turned a hundred percent. Across the street, I could see the priest walking about, carrying his own right hand as though it were a mallet. The white band of his Roman collar was now stained a deep shade of scarlet. I was walking about in some sort of stupor, my nose bleeding and my legs failing from my fall down the cellar stairs. Behind me, Stephanie Daniels appeared on her front porch, Skeel baby still in its carrier, holding its blood bottle close, as a mantis does its decapitated lover. My body writhed in panicked fear. Hopeless. Hopeless. Counselor, the jaundiced cop said, stepping out of his parked cruiser. It would appear you've been breaking some of our laws. He took out a citation book, as though he were a study about to nail me for speeding. Whoever was shooting from the boarded up house lit the officer up with a spray of bullets, but no blood was forthcoming from the cop, who merely shook like a wet dog. Old Lady Wilcox, he told Stephanie, as though they were ordering an office lunch. We'll take care of her next. I looked up at the magnificent sun as it descended behind the surrounding hills and cast its final rays of dying light upon the desecrated mountain town. I was surrounded, surrounded, and much too tired and slow to make another run for it. I would have to use the only tool I've ever had, the power of persuasion. Listen, I'm only here because I'm Turner Dunn's court-appointed public defender, I said. He was saying some crazy shit about this place, so I wanted to investigate. But now I know he was lying, I continued, because obviously this place is far more fucked up than he let on. The master was a barrister once, the officer said in an even tone. In a former life, so to speak. London. I sat down on the curb, allowed my new companion's hungry eyes to take me in. I saw them lick their chops at the sight of the blood still dripping from my nose. Maybe it was broken after all. I awaited the onslaught, saying a silent prayer to a god I only half believed in. What is it you want? I asked. World domination? To simply be left alone? Clean air? Fresh food, so to speak? This was negotiation one under one attempt to see the matter from the other side's point of view. It was really no different from negotiating with a district attorney. As I spoke, I tried my best to not shake in desperate fear. I felt that at any moment, one of the unearthed ones might snap at me like a hungry animal, tear at my soft lawyer skin and rip out my vocal cords. But they didn't. They explained that all they really wanted was a tiny town they could fully control, one that allowed them to not be hunted and provided decent food options from local metro areas. They didn't want there to be too many vampires, mind you, because that lead to competition, but they needed full control of a town so that it could appear to function normally. Gee. Just fit the bill. They were tired of living the shadows, so to speak. We're really close to Pittsburgh here, to Scranton, to Philadelphia, the priest explained. And if somebody goes missing from one of those places, then nobody really notices. It's just a statistic, not a big deal. Understood, I said, as though I were a worldly realtor weighing the pros and cons of purchasing a new condo. Never shit where you eat, right? Makes perfect sense. Next, I decided to find their negotiating pain points. Listen, I explained. My colleagues know that I'm here. If I go missing, then two people like me are going to show up, and then four, then eight, and that might make for easy meals for a little while. But eventually it's going to draw a giant fucking X on this place. But if you let me go, then I promise I'll never say a word about this town's little secret. I get to live. You get to live in peace in your beautiful little town. It's a win-win deal. And you'll plead your client to insanity, I presume? Asked a new voice. The head honcho himself. Dracula, or whatever our modern-day equivalent of Dracula is. George Clooney. This dude wasn't wearing a cape or anything, he just looked timelessly awesome. He walked with a crystal vanity cane and he was wearing one of those 50s style hats, though I'm not sure which century's 50s exactly. He was sipping a Manhattan made out of fresh blood from a gold-rimmed martini glass. Somebody's blue eyeball was floating in it as a garnish. Oh, and he had the coolest pair of vintage sunglasses you'd ever hope to see in the wild. This was a vampire who understood both style and irony. Master, said the others in unison. Well, except the Skeela baby. 
Skeely Baby was incapable of doing anything more than hissing or cooing, though it apparently far preferred the former. The barrister, I said, mock bowing. He explained that he had heard my proposal and that he found my predicament most interesting. But what assurances do we have that you wouldn't open your flabby mouth? I sat down shaking in fear, my mind sharp with thought, and then it came to me, an idea so stupid, so lawyerly, that it might just work. I'll sign you all up as clients, I said. Then I can't repeat what I saw because of the attorney-client privilege. I don't think that's quite how it works, the barrister said, but then he admitted it had been more than a century since he'd last practiced law. Apparently, he mostly dabbled in real estate and mayhem these days. In time I had drawn up a contract, and we all signed it in counterpart, as us lawyers say, though they wouldn't let me have my copy. The barrister promised me that if I reneged on the offer at all, he would have me and everyone I cared about murdered in the most grim manner possible. I joked that as a lawyer, I only really cared about myself. We'll see, perhaps, the barrister said. We'll see if that's so true. Sorry about your truck, the priest said after the contract had been executed. By then, the vampies were all drinking the blood of Wilcox, and they had given me some boxed wine. I had insisted on white, for obvious reasons. No worries, I told the priest. And, uh, sorry about your hand getting severed. The good news is it doesn't hurt, the priest said. Not one bit. After that, everyone was in a much better mood. We spent the night playing pinnacle while the vampies debated global warming, proper skin care, and whether dew or buck blood tasted closer to human when they were hard up for food. I mostly focused on my card hands. That's not to say either side passed the evening without trepidations. There was more side-eyeing and paranoia than a Tarantino film. They loved to discuss heretical topics and seemed ready to fly into a frenzy at any moment. My blood pushed forth fresh blood. With all that said, considering the company I generally keep as other lawyers, I've had worse evenings. Before sunrise, the friendly local vampire mechanic had repaired my truck and I was sent on my way home, where I immediately checked into a hospital and ranted and raved about all that I had seen. You really didn't think I was going to honor my attorney-client pact with that village of bloodsuckers, did you? But though I've tried to take a light tone in this retelling, earlier today I heard some sad and discomforting news. Turner Dunn had apparently hung himself with his bedsheets last night in prison, and I can't help but think it was an inside job if you catch my morphine-dripped drift. Nobody believed Turner until it was too late. What's wrong with our species? We never believe anything or anyone until it's... Too late. There's a nurse now knocking at my curtain. Can one knock at a curtain? You know what I mean. She's letting in the county sheriff. He has a wolf-like face and surprisingly large incisors. He's telling me he wants a minute alone to talk. He says I need to put down my laptop. Now. To talk. He says to trust him. Says this will take but a minute. My philosophy class just created the first vampire. Do you want to live forever? Those were my philosophy professor's words before he killed himself right in front of us. A year ago, I would have said yes without hesitation. I think anyone would have. The possibility of never seeing death has always been at the back of my mind since becoming aware of it as a kid. I have always been terrified of death in the exact way everyone else is. On a road trip with my best friend, the question came up late at night with the sun bobbing across the horizon. I was sticking my head out of the window, enjoying the cool air whipping my hair from my eyes, when she asked me out of nowhere. I said yes, of course, I did. Who wouldn't want to cheat death and see a new millennium and several after that? Who didn't want to stop aging at 21 and never see wrinkles lining their face? I grew up watching commercials for skin creams and anti-aging formulas and ignored them because in my kid mind, I was going to live forever. I saw my youth as never ending because as kids we don't really think about death. I explained this to my friend, and she nodded and smiled through the whole thing before turning to the road and gripping the steering wheel tighter. Nah, she told me with a smile, 
Wouldn't you get tired? Tired? I turned back to her with a frown. Tired of living, April said. Wouldn't you get tired of living year after year with the same face? You never age, and eventually, the people you meet and fall in love with will die. She shrugged. Everything withers and dies, it's nature. We live and we die and that's it. When it's our time, it's our time. And I think that's beautiful, my best friend murmured more to herself than me. When I asked her if she was afraid of dying, she just laughed. Afraid? She shot me a grin. Why would I be afraid? Not being able to think, I told her, a shiver sliding down my spine at the thought. Just the dark. You die, and it's just dark, right? It's nothing. It ends in nothing, and continues into nothing. There's no waking up or stray thoughts. There's nothing. I leaned away from the window, enjoying the graze of wind against my cheeks. And we won't even know we're not thinking, because we won't be able to, right? Dying isn't just dying as a physical body. Your soul dies too, everything that is you stops. <laughs> that is what haunted me during the night when I was trying to sleep, or finding my thoughts wandering while sitting in the tub. The thought of everything just ending. It twisted my gut. I saw death as a never-ending tunnel that bled into oblivion. She nodded, reaching out to turn the radio down. Yeah, but it'll be peaceful. Turning to me, her expression this time was completely serious, and I didn't see that a lot. She never took anything seriously, and when she did, it didn't take her long to laugh it off or make a joke out of it. Wouldn't you want that? After years of living the same life, wouldn't you get tired and want that kind of heavenly peace? April pulled a face. I mean, regardless of what you believe in, whether that's the great pearly gates or oblivion, you would want to sleep at one point right? This time, my friend looked concerned. Because in my expression, as well as the words tangled on my tongue, I did not ever want to see oblivion. I didn't want to lose my self-awareness and just die. The idea of losing myself completely to the void was terrifying, and when I tried to tell her this, she just laughed and told me when I was older, like in my 70s or 80s, I would think much differently after living long enough to grow tired of the sunrise and sunset and the world changing around me. The world outgrows us, she said. Technology and AI will only get smarter and we'll find ourselves in a world we don't understand and we won't want to understand, she chuckled. I visit my grandma once a week. She was diagnosed with Alzheimer's so she barely even knows my name, but sometimes she flickers back to life and tells me she's tired. April's voice broke a little. She's tired and she wants to sleep. My friend tried to smile, but I knew talking about her grandma hurt her. And I can understand her. She's almost 98 and can't even die the way she wants to. Naturally, with her friends and family around her. Instead, she will just be alone. April leaned back with a sigh, her usual smile twitching into a frown. Even alive and breathing, my grandma will be alone and it will be just like death because she won't have her own thoughts and feelings and memories. It will just be nothing. Alone. The word didn't really hit me until I thought about it. Did I want to outgrow everyone else around me and be alone in a world I didn't understand and one which didn't want me? Did I want to lose people I love to old age and live past my expiry date? Yes. I did. Against all odds, yes, I didn't care about outgrowing the people around me, and yes, I wouldn't mind living in a world that had outlived me. Yes. I found myself responding to our professor. I was doodling Adventure Time characters in my notebook when the question was asked, and finally I lifted my head, severed from my own thoughts. I only joined Professor Jackson's class to get closer to a girl I had a slight crush on, and every class since, had been a total bore and the students were exactly what I were expecting them to be like. Still though, I was working up the courage to talk to my crush, so I spent most of the time either doodling or daydreaming. The class itself was pretty peaceful. The lights above were a warm glow and easy on the eyes. I usually found myself dozing to the sound of the tap 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 of typing on laptops and the professor's monotone drawl as he paced the stage. That particular question, however, pricked my interest. 
because usually I was asking it myself as a shower thought, or going through the positives and negatives on a long car ride, with nothing to do but listen to an audiobook and stare at the long stretch of road ahead, sometimes bleeding into the sky. Around me, I could see that question had caused a slight stir. The girl sitting next to me, who had been idly scrolling down her Twitter timeline on her MacBook, briefly averted her gaze from a BTS fan at it, her eyes flickering to the front of the hall and then to me. I don't usually speak up in class because I have nothing to say, nothing to discuss and nothing to debate. The class bored me, the discussions bored me, and the debates when they happened were less about getting words across and more about either gaslighting 12, yes, there were only 12 of us, students for their own pleasure or arguing until they were blue in the face about something as simple as logic and why we have it. Most of the time, it was just about being right. I chose to keep my head down because most of the time, I had no idea what any of them were talking about. I mean, I knew the basics, and then some. But after a while, they started to sound like they were speaking in an ancient language. With my voice splintering the otherwise peaceful silence, the professor nodded and gestured to me. Why? I wasn't expecting such a dull response. In every other class, he answered questions to students with even more confusing questions which were both rhetorical and not. Professor Jackson thrived on getting a discussion going. But this time, he simply stopped pacing the stage and looked directly at me, inclining his head when my mind went blank. I didn't mean to answer this question out loud, but now that I was really thinking about it, I had a lot to say. Why do you want to live forever? I shrugged, fully aware of 12 pairs of eyes on me. Well, I don't want to die, I said, my cheeks growing warm. If I had a chance to live forever, I would. You don't want to die or you are scared of dying? Both. I think that was the universal answer anyway. Professor Jackson nodded in response. I wasn't even sure if he knew my name. The man was a 30-something-year-old with the eyes of someone much older. I often wondered if he had ever experienced trauma or pain because, in the rare moments when our eyes met, his were like no other I had seen before. I don't think haunted is the right word. I wouldn't say he had haunted eyes. But they definitely spoke of something dark, something deeply embedded inside of him, which brought on this kind of question. If anything, he looked like he was in pain. Not always. But when I focused on him and truly drank him in, his lips were always pressed in a line, eyes narrowed in a certain way, inclining he was writhing in pain. I wondered if he had chronic headaches. Professor Jackson wasn't an ordinary teacher. He didn't care about us missing due dates or work he had assigned and often had an oh well, it's your future lol kind of attitude. The guy wore the same white collared shirt and tie with the sleeves rolled up and a blazer that hung off his wiry frame. Nothing really fit him. His shirt was always untucked and buttoned wrong and he had come to class twice wearing his shoes on odd feet. Nobody wants to die, he said, but would you really want to keep living generations into the future? Think about it. He cleared his throat. Everyone you have ever loved or cared about is dead and buried. The places you called home are now eaten up by nature. Every face is a stranger to you, and you are too scared to form an attachment to someone because you will inevitably outlive them. His expression darkened. You will watch them grow old, and yet your face will stay frozen in time. You will get asked questions. Why you never look any different and you have to lie to them and make a swift getaway to avoid alerting authorities, which you know will never catch up to you. Oh, no, you are too fast for them. But the idea of revealing this gift to the world scares you. He paused to direct his question to the rest of the class. Tell me, seriously, would you, against all odds, accept immortality? Duh. Casper Littlewood looked up from the essay he was typing for a different class. Until then, I figured he wasn't listening, engrossed in his own work. But then he closed his laptop and leaned back in his chair with his arms folded. Who wouldn't? The rest of the class murmured in agreement and our professor nodded before walking back to the wooden podium where he had been reading from his own published journals. Oh? His lips curved into the first smile I'd ever seen from him. Sure. His facial muscles sometimes contorted and quirked into the start of one, 
but never really settled on a real and proper smile. He leaned forward, a brow arched. So, all twelve of you are saying yes, and accepting a chance at having immortality. Yes, this time I didn't say it out loud. Professor Jackson hummed. And the baggage which comes with it? Again, yes. The students around me responded with light hums and nods. I wondered if he was going to catapult into some kind of fictional scenario which branched out into two different paths. One would be the good side of being able to live forever, and the other, the more negative approach. Regardless of where he was going with it, now I was fully interested in this blooming discussion. Usually, I doodle when I'm really focusing on a subject, and I started to shade the corner of a page of my notebook. Except Professor Jackson didn't speak. I waited for him to, but instead there was this long stretch of eerie silence, bar the noise of the boy next to me tapping his pen on the edge of the desk. I lifted my head to see if the guy was setting up a presentation, or reading his own notes before a girl screamed. It wasn't a long time, more of a shriek of fright. At first I thought her reaction was a spider before my eyes found hers, which were pinpointed on the front of the class where our professor stood. Following her gaze, I found myself eye to eye with Professor Jackson, and when I tried to look away, I found I couldn't. Professor Jackson was smiling this time. I wouldn't say his smile was at all twisted with evil or pleasure at the thought of doing what he was about to do. Instead, I only saw peace. It was the first real and proper smile I had seen on his face, and this one was genuine. I wasn't sure if the fact that he was actually smiling had taken my eyes and mind hostage, or his fingers were wrapped around the handle of a particular-looking dagger. Particular, because I had never seen anything like it. The handle itself was gilded gold, and the blade looked sharp enough to cut through metal. I should have been able to predict what Professor Jackson did next, but I found myself choked with naive thoughts. Maybe he was going to use the knife as a metaphor I didn't understand, or present it to the class as a model in whatever scenario he was going to delve into. But no. With a peaceful smile that only spoke of escape and freedom, our teacher plunged the blade into his throat. For a dizzying moment, I thought I imagined it. These are the types of daydreams our intrusive thoughts bring us. Thoughts of our teachers spontaneously slicing their throat open out of nowhere. I found I was completely frozen, both body and mind. I don't know if it was a trauma response my mind had shut down completely. Everything in me was telling me to look away, to get up and run out of that class and never look back. But his question was still weighing on my mind. Once curious, and now something stronger and more feral taking over me like a leash creeping into my brain and winding itself around my thoughts, eating away all logic. I did want to live forever. I did want to outlive the people and the world around me. And watching my professor choke on his own blood, on a sharp geyser of scarlet exploding from his neck like a fucking cartoon, it only made me crave immortality more. To be able to rip into my own flesh with no effect, to plunge a dagger into my heart with no consequences. It's kind of amazing how far blood can travel, especially when the right artery has been ruptured. Or maybe my mind was over-exaggerating the reality of what I was seeing. In the fog of my own thoughts, the front row was automatically hit with a shower of scarlet. I could sense their shock and horror, and yet even without looking at them, I knew they couldn't look away either. That something was eating away at their heads despite being coated in warm red. Initially, it was like being let loose to something I didn't understand, something brand new blossoming inside me. It was gentle at first, seeping into me piece by piece and getting a feel for me. But then, it started to hurt. Like a toothache, a dull but barely noticeable pain started to thrum within the confines of my mind. When Professor Jackson finally hit the ground, the twelve of us were still sitting, still staring, at the pooling red seeping across the stage and stemming around him. Something ached in my jaw, and that pain I thought would go away with a Tylenol continued to leach into the back of my throat blossoming into more of a burn. It's weird. The more I stared at the man's body lying out on the stage like that, I could feel my body starting to slowly react. I lifted myself from my seat slowly before collapsing back with a staggered breath. That pain started to get worse, and I felt it like a snake wrapping itself around me, suffocating not just my chest, but my thoughts, 
Every thought which dared graze the forefront of my mind was set on fire and replaced with that same question. And when it really hit me, bleeding into me slowly, I got up again. But this time, I stayed on my feet. My mouth was aching all over, and my teeth felt like razor blades. I had no control over my body as I took long strides toward the end of the row and then down the steps. Others joined me. But those others did not have faces in the sea of fog, which was drowning me, pulling me deep, deep down into the depths. The burning, which had not subsided, only grew worse until my brain felt like it was on fire, dragging me to the edge of my own humanity, which I had not even been aware of until it was being picked from me by invisible fingers. I didn't realize it until I was kneeling on the stage with my hands pressed into stemming scarlet, scooping up as much glistening red as possible and gulping greedily that our professor had left us with both a question and an answer. Would I like to live forever? The blood did not taste good. It tasted exactly how blood should taste. It smeared my lips and cheeks, but I continued to drink deep, bending over and pressing my lips and the tip of my tongue onto the stage and slurping up as much as I could. I wasn't alone. I felt their presence around me dropping to their knees and smothering themselves, painting themselves in our professor's blood. When I crawled over to where the man's body had been, I was left staring at a sort of ashy substance coating the stage. The body was gone, and with it, the knife which killed him. When I fully came back to reality, my brain was on fire. I don't remember leaving that class. I don't remember talking to anyone or discussing what we had just done, only that the universal and unspoken realization between the twelve of us was that our professor had given us a gift, one forced upon us when we watched him rip open his throat. That was where his bewitching began, and it ended when we had chewed the flesh from his bones until we were full and satisfied, and he was reduced to flakes spiraling into nothing. I didn't even remember fully what I had done, only that my mouth tasted of blood which now tasted good, which now tasted like liquid gold, tainting my lips when my tongue flicked out to lick at remnants. I thought I was a vampire. I went home and looked in the mirror. I had a reflection. I was still hungry and ate food. I could still drink and sleep and breathe. Nothing had changed. At least that is what I thought. The pain came much later when I was sleeping. It struck like a lightning bolt, cruel and unforgiving. Agony. It writhed through me, setting fire to every nerve ending and boiling my brain until I stuck my head in a bucket of ice. I thought it was an infection maybe brought on by the uh, activities I had taken part in. But no, I didn't have a temperature. I wasn't burning on the outside. I was burning on the inside. My fucking brain was on fire and I tried everything. When it became too intense to walk, I called an ambulance and was told I was absolutely fine. I got an Uber back to my apartment and sitting in the back of that cab, I couldn't think straight. I didn't have words to describe the pain because no words exist. I thought it would go away with multiple Tylenol. I thought it would go away by drinking my mind away. But even on the edge of reality, completely out of my fucking mind, it was still there. Cruel. Never ending. With this pain came... Visions. No, they were more like memories. Memories of places and faces frozen in time that I had only ever learned about. History. But this history was polluting my mind, endless memories of people I didn't know, and lives I had not lived. I saw families and lovers, children and elders, the world when it was at its most quiet, when it was just beginning. I thought they would stop by numbing myself with drink and weed, anything I could get my hands on. But they raged on, blossoming from simple snapshots of past eras to people who have lived and breathed, seeing through their eyes. Seeing one individual's memory is scary enough, but multiple people with different lives, all of them intersecting and looping over and over again until I could no longer see what was in front of me. All I could see was them. Daisy, who wanted to be a dancer where vehicles were only just beginning to appear on roads. Jonathan, who fought with his parents over going to fight in a war he didn't want to join. Further back than that, names I couldn't understand and faces that bled together. The world came apart and then together again endlessly. And all of these people had lived this exact pain which was driving me crazy. 
All of them, every memory I saw, all of them saw the same sunrise and same sunset, the exact same sky I could see. All of them, including our professor, joined the wave of faces pulverizing me. He had eight different lovers, males and females, all of whom he had watched age and wither and die, while he continued on with the same face, burning. It reached the point after days of ignoring classes and staying in bed that I started to consider dying, which was crazy, right? I didn't want to die. I was afraid of death, of the endless sheet of nothing which would envelop me. But anything, even what I had feared for my 19 years of life, was better than this, better than my brain boiling away. So with the clock ticking toward midnight, I locked my apartment and stepped outside. The pain was too intense for me to have thoughts and only then it was just that I wanted everything to end. Everything. I was clawing at my skull when I stepped in front of a truck and I felt it in an instant, just an instant, relief. When 8,000 tons of metal slammed into me, the pain stopped and for a glorious moment, I was left in blissful nothing. The same nothing I had been fearing since I learned what death was. And death is exactly what April told me years ago before she died of a brain tumor. Death was peaceful, and it wasn't the long, endless stretch of nothing which has paralyzed me my whole life. It was nothing, and nothing was perfect. Nothing wasn't sleep but far deeper, the deepest sleep you can imagine. But before I could fall into that nothing, something leached onto me, an invisible presence grasping hold of me and violently pulling me back. Excuse me, miss. When I opened my eyes, I was lying on rough brick, a dozen paramedics in front of me, surrounded by dizzying red and blue lights. Looking down at myself, I was in one piece. No injuries or broken bones. Nothing except that burning that continued to rage on inside my brain. Are you all right? The paramedic looked kind of startled. I would be too if a girl had walked out in front of a truck and was somehow absolutely fine. I managed to nod and get to my feet. My head was swimming. I had definitely died, there was no doubt about that. The head-on collision had made sure of that. But I wasn't dead. I was standing, no scratches on me, the cool night air grazing my cheeks. I nodded, or at least I think I nodded. I opened my mouth to speak, but the blazy inside my heed continued on, and I swallowed my words. Are you sure? The paramedic didn't look convinced. Reports say you walked directly into traffic and... He looked around helplessly. Realistically speaking, you should be dead, he said. But we may still have to check you over just in case of concussion or internal bleeding. She's fine. A voice startled me enough of a distraction from my brain slowly boiling itself. When I twisted my head, the BTS girl was standing behind me. I call her BTS girl because I hadn't yet learned her name, and all I saw on her laptop, bar essays or presentations we were going through was BTS. Just looking at her expression, the slight crease in her forehead, and her lips curled into the start of a silent cry, I knew the girl's brain was burning too. I was yet to talk to my classmates about what we did, and I wasn't planning to any time soon. I wasn't sure how to start the conversation without saying, so, we consumed our, maybe, immortal teacher. The paramedic looked skeptical, his gaze flicking to me. Do you two know each other? I found myself nodding and eventually he let me go, making me promise to drop in at an emergency room if I started to feel sick or dizzy. When she pulled me away from the scene, or lack of, I realized she wasn't alone. BTS girl, who I quickly found out was called Eve, led me to a kid's playground where the rest of the class was waiting. The majority of them were standing with serious expressions, while a guy called Noah was sitting on a swing set. I could tell from the way he was rocking backwards and forward, he wanted to actually swing. I got the basic lowdown from them. Yes, our professor had been some kind of immortal being, and when asking us if we wanted immortality, had been a contract we had signed without knowing. But we didn't sign anything, Eve said. We didn't need to. Jack, who was quickly becoming the leader, shrugged. All we had to do was say yes. And I found myself saying, yeah. 
He nodded grimly, catching my gaze. This is the baggage he was talking about. My guess is he's been waiting to pass this thing on. But how exactly did it pass on? Casper, who had been staying quiet, finally spoke up. You can't just catch immortality, right? Jack's lips quirked. I'm pretty sure we all ate and ingested our immortal teacher's body. So yeah, it can be passed on. But why did we do it? Miri, normally a vocal student in debates, now hiding behind her curls, spoke up softly. I didn't have control over myself. She shook her head, her hand suddenly going to claw at her hair. Fuck, he made me do it, I wouldn't just do that. He planted a question in our mind that we were already sure of the answer to, and then did, I don't know, magic shit or whatever, which made us do... Jack drifted off. He pulled a face, and I vaguely remembered him going to town on our teacher's guts. That, he folded his arms. Mr. Jackson was bad news, sure, but now he's dead, and regardless of whatever mind tricks he played on us, that doesn't change the fact that he's given us exactly what we wanted. He ran his hand through his hair. Or what we thought we wanted. So what do we do? Johnny, another vocal student, spoke for the first time. He collapsed into a swing set beside Noah. I can't deal with this. Whatever the fuck it is, his gaze flicked to me. She died, right? And then came back to life. So that makes us just like him. It could have been a fluke, Casper muttered. Bullshit. Miri said. That truck slammed into her. She would be a pancake right now. I started to notice the realization prickle on the other's faces. Twisted lips curled pain turned to small smiles of curiosity. We were all burning, sure. The pain was driving us crazy enough to end it all. But for us, there wasn't an end. What exactly do a group of 12 immortal 19-year-olds do when they're told they no longer have Deeth as a barrier in front of them? Well, you would be right in saying they would lose their fucking minds. I'm not sure if it was the knowledge of being completely indestructible or the burning pain which raged through the group of us. Initially, it was... fun. I think. I don't remember most of it. I started to notice little things. My period stopped and my face seemed to... freeze. I no longer got spots or sweated. Food started to taste like cardboard and I once realizing that there was no meaning of life if life did not end, I started to spiral along with the rest of my class. We split into two groups, the more feral ones who had grown bored of normal life and hunted people down for the fun of it, and our little group who found fun in the smallest of things. The others didn't hunt for food because they were still human. They hunted for the thrill of a kill and zero consequences. They denied it at first, but I mean, with disappearances being reported in the city, it was pretty obvious. First came rooftop jumping, dangerous and deadly to a human, but our new pastime, the thrill of diving across apartment buildings in the dead of night with no real danger except my skirt flying up in the battering wind. Falling felt like nothing, and the impact was like landing on a hard mattress. Quickly though, even rooftop jumping had become a bore. The burning started to take over my life when I didn't have any distractions, and the realization started to hit me. I would never die. I would keep going and going and going, outliving my parents and friends. I would watch all of them die and just keep going. In books and TV shows and movies, an immortal being gets bored of living forever after several thousands of years of being shackled to life. We got bored, or sick of it, within a year. Burning. Every day I burned and was haunted by my answer to that question. Do you want to live forever? Fuck no. Nobody tells you that immortality comes with the baggage of every single life lived and passed on through that so-called gift. And we would have to bear it. I did a lot of things I am not proud of. Though most of them were pain relief. I threw myself into a train, sliced off each of my fingers. That was part of a game and climbed to the top of the tallest building in our city, diving off of it. I landed on both feet, stumbling into an awaiting Eve's arms, who was waiting to tell me it was a terrible idea. It was a terrible idea. I had leg cramps for three days after that. 
but it still didn't distract me from the burning. Nothing did. I started to hunt, joining the other group. Well, we all just came together, really. Stupid shit like morals don't really matter when you're not really living. I came to last night, my head against cold porcelain, my mouth filled with a mixture of straight vodka and blood. I'm not sure whose it was, but it was a change from coffee and soda, both of which tasted like water. My life became a blur of bad decisions bleeding into each other. Hunting was at least some kind of pain relief, and I can't explain why. Seeing the death of someone else and knowing they are going to die, knowing you can entangle yourself with the delusion that you can die with them is at least something. Though none of us had witnessed the perfect death yet, until three days ago. Charlie was the new guy. He walked into class mid-discussion and announced he would be joining with a smile I envied. When he sat down, the smell of his coffee turned my gut and the way he sipped it with a satisfied smile. I could tell or I guess sense the rest of the class watching him. Ever since turning to our more feral side, we had claimed the current lecture hall is ours. Our professor died on the stage and we lost our humanity on that stage, so it was ours. Charlie just walking in and announcing that he was joining had definitely put a sour taste in my mouth. Next to me, Eve had stiffened up while in front of us, Casper's nose kind of flared. Our current professor welcomed him with a smile, and for the next hour her class became a white noise in my head as I found myself engrossed by everything Charlie did. When he opened his laptop and typed, taking small sips from his hydro flask and sticking his pen in his mouth, tenderly chewing on the end. Charlie asked questions while we were all silent, oblivious to twelve pairs of eyes following his every move. It wasn't fair. I caught the exact words in Casper's glare, Noah's curled lips, Miri's fingers tightened around her pen. I found myself jealous that he just sat there and smiled, occasionally checking his phone. He wasn't in pain like the rest of us, bombarded with endless memories of long-dead immortals. Eventually, I turned away from him, focusing my attention on my notebook. Before Charlie started cuffing. Violently. It started as short gasps which I thought was a panic attack. But then he grabbed his throat, his cheeks turning unnatural shades of blue and purple. Charlie's eyes were wide, terrified. His lips curled into a silent cry for help. His body was trembling as he gasped for air. The professor ran out to get help, telling us to call for help. But none of us did. Instead, I was mystified by the agony in his eyes. Finally, something I could relate to. His lips twisted and silently crying out filled me with mind-numbing euphoria. Charlie was dying. When his head hit the desk and he went still, I expected him to jolt back to life just like us. But no. Charlie stayed dead. <laughs> and it was one of the most beautiful things I had ever seen. His was the perfect death. Exactly what I had been waiting for. Slowly, we surrounded him, prodding and poking him to see if he would move. When Miri reached into his pack, she pulled out a pack of candy I'd caught him snacking on. Peanuts, she said, waving the candy wrapper in the air. I don't think he knew he was eating peanuts. That set off laughter. Hysterical laughter ricocheted across the hall. That laughter quickly quietened down when we realized Charlie would be able to die. Unlike us, he would be able to embrace death. How was that fair? Charlie just joined our class and he was the one who was able to die. Who didn't have to deal with a brain boiling itself to not death? I think it was an unspeakable pact between us that no one who joined our group would be leaving the room mortal or in a body bag. Jack suggested that we ate him. We thought about it, but the only time human flesh tasted tolerable was while we were under the control of Professor Jackson. So eating him was a no-no, and his corpse was slowly growing cold. The professor was nowhere to be seen, so this had to be fast. Miri announced that she should be the one to bite him, and when we asked her why biting would do anything, she just shrugged and said, I saw it in a movie. So biting it was. Rolling up her jacket sleeve, Miri bit into her own arm, but her teeth weren't sharp enough. So she grabbed a knife, slicing open her wrists this time, and I was entranced by rivulets of red dripping down her arm. I knew it wouldn't last, 
her skin knitting itself back together so she had to be fast. She bit him first, which was awkward because her teeth were too blunt. Jack tried, but he didn't even make a mark. Eve managed it after really clawing at his neck. Casper and Noah guarded the door while the girl straddled poor dead Charlie, eventually piercing his throat. Okay. She motioned for Miri to force her bleeding wrist into his mouth, but she shook her head, showing us her wound was already gone. Jack volunteered this time, taking the knife and stabbing himself in his hand. Call it being petty, but we were bored and jealous, and definitely envious that this kid got to see death while we were fucking cursed. I watched Jack slam his hand over Charlie's mouth, making a fist and forcing it through the boy's lips. This isn't going to work, Mary whispered. You're just making a mess. We were. Charlie's desk was covered in blood, and his bag and laptop were stained with pretty much everyone's blood, but we weren't giving up. Jack tried three more times before sitting back with a sigh, running his hands through his hair. It's not working. From the look of Charlie's very dead corpse, I figured he was right. So, we gave up. Miri did her best to clean up his desk with wet tissue paper, and Jack and Noah attempted to position Charlie respectfully. I wouldn't call hanging off his desk respectful, but sure, they were still pissed that a member of our class had escaped the painful jaws of life. The boys unlocked the door, and our professor rushed in with paramedics in tow. Charlie was pronounced dead, WBK, and carried from the lecture hall on a stretcher. When the paramedics were gone, neither of us spoke. I think we were too frustrated that Charlie had got away. That was until our professor didn't come back, and when I left the classroom to head to the bathroom, I found myself face to face with a stream of horrifying gore splattered across the floor. I saw our professor's body first. I only recognized her because of her blonde hair. The rest of her was unrecognizable, an amalgamation of shredded flesh lying in stemming scarlet. Uh, that was all I could say, just uh. Because standing among the bodies, with a paramedic's severed head in his hand, was Charlie. Well, it was mostly Charlie. He had the new boy's face, but that face was twisted into something of a monster from my nightmares. A black-like substance writhing through his flesh, like vines creeping their way up his face, like poison. His eyes still looked relatively human except for the amber glow around his iris. It began to slowly dawn on me that this is what Jack's blood and Eve's bite had done to the boy. It had not turned him immortal, or at least the way we were turned. Instead, what I was looking at was, well, I think it was a vampire, a real-life vampire, whom we had created. Uh, Charlie mimicked me, dropping the head and staggering back with a cry, his lips curling into a fanged snarl. What the fuck did you do to me? It turns out our attempt at making another immortal went kind of wrong. We're now in the possession of a newborn vampire who is completely out of control, and we still don't know how to die, or at least get rid of this intense, never-ending burning. He blames us, which is fair but he's also slowly working his way through the student body of our college, so has to be monitored all hours of the day by at least two of us. He doesn't even remember his name, which is a problem. He is a vampire, right? What else could he be? But anyway, would any of you like to live forever? Feel free to contact me. I'll also throw in a 19-year-old nihilist asshole of a vampire too if you want. I'm a vampire. Trust me, we are not the scariest thing out there. Like, I'm a vampire. Oh, please don't ask me for obscure historical knowledge. I'm only 17. No, we don't drink human blood. Well, not anymore. After your obesity crisis, human blood has really gone downhill. The consistency is really weird. And it just feels really gross, and it's sweet now. Blood used to have a really nice coppery metallic flavor. It was a huge blow to the vampire community, and we were desperate to find alternatives. Human blood was a key source of valuable nutrients, you see, and now we no longer had access to it. We needed a replacement, and fast. So first, we wanted to see if we could try animal blood. We've tried it all, dogs, cats, fish, sharks, birds. It simply lacks nutrients. It would be as if you guys just drank water all day. Vampires cannot eat plants, so that was out of the question. 
Now our alternatives are mainly elves. We've been having a ball. These fuckers are short, and we made little nets to catch them. Oh, and elf blood is fucking amazing, it's so coppery, and it's got this bitterness to it that has been addicting. It's kind of sweet, sour, and coppery at the same time, and our scientists have found it to be very rich in nutrients. Elves have been a stable food source for the vampire community for almost two decades. Once you go tiny, you never go back. Elf hunting has embedded its way into our traditions, you see. We now have this drink called a blood cocktail. We've found elf blood tastes remarkable with whiskey, which we steal from you humans, sorry not sorry. Especially paired with some ice. I've been really wanting to make my boyfriend a blood cocktail for his birthday. So I had to hunt a really good quality elf and steal some really nice whiskey. I love him so much. He's the best thing that ever happened to me, especially after my ex girlfriend friend Colleen's disappearance. I don't mind it though, she was so toxic. So I waited until midnight. I was really hoping for an elf child because those shitbags have the sweetest blood ever. It had to be today, since it was some elf festival. Dumb fucks. I could easily lure a child into the woods. Elf children love pine cones, so I had them handy. In festivals, some kid almost always gets lost, and hey, easy prey. Elf towns are usually somewhere in the woods, so I walked through the long, gorgeous black trees. I'm six feet tall, so I'll be able to blend in with the trees for these dumb elves. I made sure to stick to the trees, heading south, and soon I stumbled across a little elf town. There was a ferris wheel the size of a typical birdcage, and they were having a little carnival with bright red tents and golden merry-go-rounds, with little diamond-like horses, and I saw those ugly green fucks everywhere their scent overpowered my senses, sweet tangy copper blood flowing through their veins. I could almost taste it. It was fairly dark and I stood right in front of a tree. I was wearing black gloves and a mask so my camo was near perfect. I watched their stupid fucking carnival, trying to keep my stomach from growling, when an elf child happened to look lost. I could see its ugly elf face twist into confusion, and I could see it make its way towards the trees, waddling towards me. I watched it stumble around, and soon it was in the woods with me. I had to make my move. It was towards a neighboring tree. Are you lost, sweetheart? Who are you? I'm a tree and I'm here to help you, sweetheart. Help me? Trees can talk? Yes, sweetheart, but not everyone can hear us. You have a gift, you see, to be able to. Talk to nature. Come towards me, sweetie, and I'll tell you more. What I thought was a dumb idiot waddled its way towards me. Suddenly, I realized something and my blood froze. I couldn't smell it as it waddled towards me. The scent was not getting stronger at all. It actually had no scent at all, kind of like water. That was fucking weird. As it waddled, I could see its face more clearly, and it did not look right. Almost like someone had made a drawing of an elf, rather than an actual elf itself. My god, it was fucking 2D looking. And it could tell I wasn't a fucking tree because it was looking at me right in the eyes, and then it fucking smiles. Though it was smiling with just its mouth, I could see its mouth stretch open, the corners switching positions. Its mouth was flipping, almost like it was lifted of its face, and then moved back. Its eyes were wide and pitch black. Its skin was ashy gray instead of a simple green. The little shit had claws. I looked around me, and it felt like being high. The trees were fucking dancing. Nah, fuck that. I frantically ran, Lil shit was still short, however the ground was floating up and down. It was fucking bouncing. I didn't dare to look behind me, just ran like a motherfucker. Then this little shit shows up in front of me, like dead in front, and I look around and the world felt like some kind of web as if the fabric of the world structure of it got smooshed into a web-like shape, and if it was some kind of paper, and I was in the very center and I could feel myself began to fall, deep until I was covered in the fabric of the topsy-turvy world with felt weightless, and I was enfolded in just complete, utter terror. As if the world around me was a movie set, or a kind of drape, that could be closed. Then I looked at my hands and I saw a golden streak flow upwards, Blood was flowing out of my hands into the web. I felt dizzy, with terror and with blood loss. And I looked up and could see a giant mouth with alternating fangs, and its eyes were fucking connected to its fangs, as if it used both its eyes and mouth to eat. 
I didn't know what to do. This was my karma, I guess. Was it a possessed elf? Slowly the world thudded, rumbled, and fucking swayed, and then it was back to normal again. I could hear the little shit retching. Guess Mofo didn't like my blood. I took my chance and fucking sprinted despite the dizziness, and managed to make it back to my house. I opened the door and then collapsed on the floor. I woke up to my boyfriend blowing up my phone about whether I was cheating on him, and how could I on our anniversary? I was, but not on our anniversary. And forget him. I wanted to tell you guys to stop complaining about vampires. It's really annoying. I was also wondering if any of you knew what that thing was, because no vampire I've talked to knows about it. You guys know what mind bendy space psycho elves are? The night that I became the Vampire King, the warehouse sits in the middle of the old industrial district. An ugly block of concrete, it sprawls across the land, casting its weary gaze out onto its dilapidated surroundings. There was a time when it was the shining jewel of this town, a time when it would bustle with the optimistic energy of the workers who lived identical lives in identical houses just over the hill, when large boxes of electronics would pass through it on their way to different corners of the country, and sometimes even across the sea. But all that is ancient history, of course. For now, it is nothing but an eyesore battered with age, a sad and decrepit reminder of this town's once great potential. Wind whistles through its shattered windows like the mournful howl of an abandoned dog. Weeds and ivy crawl up its sides as if trying to make it sink into the ground, while a chain of grimy, flickering tube lights adorning its crumbling boundary wall desperately try to sweep aside the gloom that has settled into its very bones. Definitely not a place a fledgling like me would choose to spend his Friday night at. But sometimes things are so far beyond our control that we can do naught but be swept by the tides of causality. As I climb out of my car, I adjust the buttons of my suit and let my eyes drift over the warehouse. Not because it holds my interest in any way, but because I would rather look at anything but at the man. No, the creature standing outside the rusted front gate. I fix my gaze on the walls. I focus on the paint that peels off them, making the building look like a dying snake trying to shed its skin one last time. I imagine myself wriggling into the cracks of the warehouse, hiding until all the shit that's about to go down tonight is over. But I know I will not be afforded that luxury. Already I can feel the man growing restless. Immense pressure emanates from his body, presses up against me like a knife scraping against the very bone of my throat. I sigh, shake my head and begin walking towards him. The air grows colder and thicker the closer I get to him. Gently swirls around him, shimmering like a soft white mist under the dull streetlight. I loosen my tie to try and make it easier to breathe. It doesn't work. Fuck, I really should have drank more blood before coming here. You are late, the man remarks, his silky voice gliding effortlessly out of his mouth. Apologies, your excellency, I reply, my head bowed. The preparations took a little longer than expected. I risk a glance at him. He's staring at me. Ageless, poreless skin stretched across a youthful face studded with ancient eyes. Large, gold-rimmed black pupils like twin solar eclipses. I feel a shudder run through me. Let's dispense with the formalities, shall we? Call me Julius. I may be young, but I wasn't a total novice at the dance. I knew a trap when I saw one. I... I couldn't possibly do that, sire. He smirks, his fangs glinting silver under the pale light. It would be so easy for him to rip my throat out. You're a quick learner, aren't you? I can see why Jakob thinks so highly of you. I say nothing. Just give a reverent nod in response. Pity he couldn't be here. The king requested my master's presence at the royal lodge, sire. Ah, yes, of course. When his most venerable majesty calls, you sure damn well answer. A lesson Michael here seems to have forgotten. He reaches into the jacket of his sleek gray suit, pulls out a cigar from a small metal case and jams it between his teeth. So, are your men ready? They are at your command, I reply as I give him a light. Praetorians, all of them. Finest troops on the east coast. 
but of course he knows that. Who? How many? Where? An elder like him would have known the answers to those questions the minute those soldiers stepped foot inside the town. I wish I could sense them as well. My inability to do so reminds me of my own weakness, makes me feel uneasy, exposed. Elder Julius takes a long drag from his cigar. I'm impressed you managed to convince the Prime Consul to hand over the Praetorians. I give him a humble smile. It was all Master Jacob's doing. It was he who convinced them that it was necessary to bring this war to an end. And of course, a phone call from the Royal Lodge sealed the deal. The powerful vampire shakes his head with a chuckle. All that for lil' old Michael. Overkill, if you ask me. That little cockroach doesn't deserve all the attention. The eponymous cockroach here, of course, is the little brother of the vampire king of this great nation. And also, the seventh most powerful blood-sucking creature on the continent. I curse him under my breath, yet again, for setting up his base on what has just recently become our turf, forcing us to participate in this civil war. Elder Julius sniffs the air like a bloodhound. I can smell them in there, Michael and his men. It's faint, but it's there. The stale stench of fear, like rust on an old metal pipe. He smiles, bears his fangs. Oh, how I've looked forward to this night. I've finally caught you, you slippery little bastard. My throat feels like sandpaper. The very thought of standing in the same room as these monsters sets my nerves on edge. But to go to war with them? I can feel the beast within me lashing out, trying to rip my sanity to shreds for daring to go along with this foolishness. I grit my teeth and steady myself. All right, let's get started, shall we? Elder Julius says, as he tosses his mostly intact cigar aside. It bounces off the asphalt, sends sparks flying into the air. The old vampire proceeds to untie his ponytail, his long silver hair spilling across his shoulders like a lion's mane. He then closes his eyes, cracks his knuckles, and unleashes himself. Terror ripples through me as I'm hit with the full extent of his power. It feels like my head is being crushed in a vice while I'm drowning in acid. My brain pounds in my skull, my lungs burn, my knees wobble. Heat sears every pore in my skin. It takes everything I have to just keep standing. Dear God, just how powerful is he? And then, just as quickly as it had started, the insane pressure is gone. The power that burned hot enough to scorch my soul itself is once again ensconced within Elder Julius's body. I lean against the wall, try and catch my breath. You all right there? He asks, amused, twirling a small knife in his hands. I cough. You certainly know how to make an entrance, sire. He glides over to the wall, eases himself against it, and waits for the chaos to start. That little display of power is intended to hit two birds with a single stone, to throw Michael and his men into complete disarray, and to signal to the Praetorians to take advantage of the resultant confusion and begin their assault. Cold air licks at the back of my neck as I strain my ears for any signs that the enemy has taken notice of Elder Julius's performance. Frantic pattering of booted feet, angry, panicked whispers, metallic clicks of guns being loaded. But there's nothing. The warehouse is shrouded in a nervous silence. Something's wrong, I say, my tense shoulders turning in knots. He doesn't say anything. Did they know that he was here? Is that why they haven't broken the silence? Couldn't be. I'm sure they must have sensed my presence when I arrived here. I'm too young, too weak to fully meld with the shadows. But Elder Julius? No, you only see him if he lets you. Something is terribly wrong here. Muttering something under his breath, Elder Julius whips his knife in the air and begins marching towards the front door of the warehouse. I pull my Glock out of its holster and start to follow. I spot the Praetorians as soon as we turn the corner and walk through the gate. They have fanned out, surrounded the warehouse from all sides, guns aimed at the numerous shattered windows that dot its walls. Two of them break off and begin jogging towards us, their boots clicking on the cracked and overgrown asphalt. Elder Julius stops as they approach, lower their rifles and greet him with a bow. Sire, the one on the right says, fangs and blood-red lips peeking through the balaclava. We've taken a look inside. It's strange. Explain, he demands. They exchange a look. It's best if you see for yourself. 
He nods and they draw their guns up and begin leading us towards the broad front door of the warehouse. Faded white paint, rusted hinges that creak with the cold wind. The door is on its last legs, and the Praetorian puts it out of its misery by kicking it down, sending it slamming onto the ground with a resounding boom. The Praetorians switch on the flashlights mounted on their guns, swing it around the dark interior of the warehouse, and we see why none of our enemies had reacted earlier. Because they're all dead, the warehouse had been turned into a fortress. Sandbag defenses, machine guns mounted at key positions. They had a death trap waiting for us. But the only carnage that greets us is one that seems to have taken place hours ago. I see walls and floors splattered with dried, corrupted blood. Corpses slumped against sandbags and machine guns, sometimes whole, often in unrecognizable pieces. Shriveled up innards litter the dusty floor and hang from broken light fixtures like bunting. And the smell. Dear God, the smell. Vile stench of vampire gore. And refuse stabs at my brain through my nostrils. And something else. Old rot. Like things decaying under a hot desert sun. I clamp my hand on my mouth to stop myself from retching. Seems like Michael's group had a bit of a falling out. The Praetorian who led us here remarks. That's not what this is. Elder Julie's replies, his voice now muted. Serious. The boisterousness in his demeanor is completely gone. I force my pupils to dilate and stare at him. The worry that creases his forehead is more terrifying than the macabre sight in front of me. I feel saliva drying up in my mouth. Is something wrong, sire? The Praetorian asks. Yeah, the smell. It's strong here overpowers the senses, but it's far too faint outside. I had to concentrate just to get a slight whiff. He takes a pause, almost as if the stench is being suppressed, contained within these walls. Cold shivers rack my spine. He turns to look at me. You had people watching this place, did you not? I nod. Yes, sire. Two men positioned on the hill overlooking this warehouse, around the clock. Me and I'm assuming they didn't hear our friends here being torn apart. I shake my head. What could be powerful enough to hide something like this? Just the thought makes my head swim. Hmm. Intriguing. He places a foot on a mutilated corpse lying face down on the ground, kicks it onto its side. And there's the matter of the bite marks on these bodies. I narrow my eyes as they wander over the corpse but my vision isn't strong enough to make out the wounds. Thankfully, the white glow of a flashlight passes over it, reveals the injuries. Small bites, single puncture wounds, Elder Julius says, all over the body, like he was bitten by some sort of a critter. What do you think happened here? I whisper in disbelief. That's exactly what I intend to find out. He replies before jabbing his thumb at the Praetorian. Get your men inside. Search all the bodies. Find Michael. I am going to find out what happened here, even if I have to drag that bastard right out of hell. The rest of the Praetorians swiftly pour into the warehouse, their flashlights bobbing and weaving across every inch of the structure. The very air inside brims with power oozing out of the powerful vampires. But there's an undercurrent of something else in here, a faint presence of something long gone that still lingers in the air. Even I can sense it. A trace of immense power that makes everyone inside uncomfortable and fearful. The Praetorians, clad in black body armor, sift through the tattered remains splattered everywhere. Some faces are too brutally smashed to be recognized, and for that they rely on Elder Julius and the Praetorians who've interacted with Michael in the past and are familiar with the stench of his blood. We don't find Michael. And Elder Julius begins to grow restless. Until we do find something, Tucked away in a damp and dark corner of the warehouse, behind a sandbag wall, beneath about a dozen bloody and broken limbs. There's a trap door here. We rush towards the voice wading through the bloody muck on the floor and find two soldiers hunched over the dusty, grimy trap door. It's large, about the length of a man. I didn't know this place even had a basement, I say. Yeah? Maybe this is why old Michael chose this place. Elder Julius says, Open it. 
There's a shrieking groan as the two Praetorians force the hatch open, revealing a steep flight of stone stairs that leads into the darkness below. Elder Julius bends over, squints, and then frowns. Give me a flashlight, he says, and for a moment there's a pause. All of us around him are taken aback, for there is no reason a creature as old as him would need a light to see in the dark. A natural darkness, that is. He grabs a flashlight from one of the soldiers and begins descending down the stairs. I follow, and so do two of the Praetorians. The steps are too small, and I'm afraid of tripping and crashing into the Elder, sending us both hurtling downstairs. What would he do if that happened, I wonder? Cut my head off mid-air simply for my stupidity? It's damp down here, smells of wet cloth is forgotten in dark. Unheated rooms, or water leaking from cracked pipes and rotting in the walls. And there's another scent, somewhat masked by the former, yet not quite blending in. It reeks like moist ashes of a dead fire. I cringle my nose and keep moving downwards. The stairs drop us off at a small landing, hemmed in by the walls. A sleek wooden door is set into the wall directly in front of us. Faint yellow light seeps out from the gap beneath the door, suggests that the room beyond might be illuminated. Elder Julius steps forward, places his hand on the gilded doorknob, turns it, and pushes the door open. My mouth drops at the sight beyond the door. The room is cramped with a mud roof that hangs so low I have to bend my neck just to stand here. Dozens of shadows dance across the room as candles, at various stages of their life, burn from their perches on earthen flooring on shelves carved into the mud walls, and most importantly on the altar placed next to the far wall, bathing the tiny space in a dull, shimmering yellow glow. And slumped against the small table that serves as the altar, rests the corpse of our quarry. Michael. His jaw has been ripped clean off. His tongue hangs limply on his neck. Even his eyes have been gouged out. Blood from his wounds has drenched his white dress shirt, turning it dark red. I have never seen such terrifying violence. Who would inflict such hatred on someone else, and be powerful enough to be able to inflict it on a vampire like Michael? Oh, Michael, Elder Julius whispers, you reckless fool, what the fuck have you done? I sense pure, unadulterated terror in the Elder's voice, and that terror gets magnified in my heart. My eyes get drawn once again to the altar. In the middle of it sits an eight-pointed star, made of some strange black metal that I don't recognize. It is ringed by half a dozen tiny, underdeveloped skulls, like those of aborted fetuses. Their white bones have been splashed with blood. Human blood. He opened a door that should not have been opened. My heart skips a beat as the strange feminine whisper drifts through the stale, smoky air in the room, reverberates through the walls. It echoes in my bones, makes me feel violated, like a wet tongue forcibly thrust down my ear. Those of us in the room whirl around frantically, weapons waving in the air trying to locate the source of that voice. It sounded like it had been spoken by someone standing with us, but of course that voice was totally alien. My sanity begins to fray. The voice once again fills the air, but this time it's even lower and completely incomprehensible, but I can feel the power in it. Makes my bones rattle, shakes the blood in my insides. And then another sound joins in, squeaks. At first, it's barely audible, like a fly buzzing in my ear, but it continues to get louder and louder, till it becomes deafening, starts to scrape at my very eardrums. What the fuck is that? One of the Praetorians shouts. Stand back to back, Elder Julius screams. No one listens. For the next second, something digs through the ground beneath us. The dirt in the center of the room is pushed aside, a small hole is opened up, and a mass of brown fur pours out of it. Rats. Hundreds of them start to swarm us, all squeaky with glowing red eyes and serrated smiles. The flood of moving fur and flesh crashes into us, biting, gnawing, picking the flesh from our bones. We try to fight back, but it's useless. I get two shots off before the pain from the bites makes me drop the gun and I stumble backwards. Little rat paws scratching my flesh. They crawl up the inside of my thighs and all I can do is scream. The Praetorians don't fare any better. Even Elder Julius, old and powerful as he is, meets an inglorious end at the hands and claws and teeth of the rats. He waves his knife around, 
slicing dozens of them into pieces with each swing, smashes apart hundreds of them with his telekinetic powers, but thousands instantly replace them. Tumbling and trampling over another, they wriggle out of holes in dark, unseen corners and blanket the room, a moving carpet of brown fur that snuffs out all traces of light. It isn't long before the pain numbs my mind, knocks me unconscious. Pain. It's the last thing I felt before fading away and is the first thing that greets me when I wake up. It feels like my entire body is on fire. Every muscle, however many the rats left behind, throbs and aches. I would scream if I had any strength left to do so. I'm lying face down on the ground? Where? I can't tell. It hurts too much to move my head, but my cheek feels wet. Blood. Slowly and very carefully I sniff it. It's not my own, not even human. It's clotted and has a vile, corrupt stench to it, but it's blood nonetheless. My tongue darts out of my mouth, takes a quick lick. It's utterly disgusting, yet in my weakened state, feels heavenly. I move my head, bite my cheek to fight through the pain that explodes in my skull and begin lapping at the pool of clotted blood on the dusty ground beneath my head. Strength begins to seep into my body once again. Oh, looks like you're finally awake. My body trembles in surprise. It's that voice again, the one that unleashed this nightmare on us. I crane my neck and look up and see a naked woman staring down at me. She's holding a rat in her hand, a long and sharp fingernail digging into its throat. Need more? She asks, amused, and slices the rat's neck open before I can answer. I hungrily drink the blood that streams down on my face, grateful for the sustenance. I can feel some of my wounds stitching themselves back up. The woman reaches down towards me, lifts me up by the arm and helps me sit up against something cool and smooth. I cough and notice that it's the door of a car. My car. How are you feeling, Childy? I look up again and notice the blazing scenery behind her. It's the warehouse. It's on fire. Dazzling orange flames burst out of the windows, crackling and licking the air. What? I croak. What happened? To your friends? She asks. I killed them all, just like the ones who summoned me. I stare at her. She has no presence. Unlike Elder Julius who would make your heart tremble by just standing next to you, this woman feels like nothing, like a dark, empty void. It makes my soul shiver. What, what are you? I ask, terrified. A friend, if you would let be one. She answers, smiling. It doesn't reach her eyes. Oh God, those eyes. Large yellow irises and narrow black slits for pupils, like a cat. You can call me Inanna. Please, I beg. For what? My life, I think. Let me go. I'm afraid I can't quite do that. My heart sinks. Why? What do you want from me? She caresses my cheek with her hand, looks at me with pity. I'm going to make this world burn, Childy, and you're going to help me, are you not? My mouth begins to move on its own. Yes, mistress, of course I am.